Hi, y'all. New Democratic primary season, larger clown car, kind of the same party, kind of the same news media. It's, it's, uh, it's like very many of them did, has, have learned nothing in the last couple of years, so I guess keep doing the same thing and expect different results in the future. That'll be smart. You know, hope it works out for you. Anyway, uh, before I start on the, the debates, uh, just a general gripe that I have about the way the debates are had, not for the Democrats uh, exclusively. Uh, it happens in the Republicans uh, for their uh, various debates. It happens for the Democrats in their various debates. It happens a lot in um, all kinds of debates, actually. They, they like to get a lot of different opinions, a lot of different people to give opinions. And so they put so many people up at one time to speak that no one really gets an opportunity to say very much at all. And this is like a little game that they play. It's like, okay, candidate or speaker number one, I have uh, question A for you. Speaker number two, I have question A for you. Speaker number three, I have question B for you, which B is about what speaker one said. So uh, please tell me something that, that is uh, going to cut the legs out from speaker one or speaker two or whatever it is. And it's that kind of game. And it's, you know, it's very clear that the media does not see itself as an organization whose responsibility, function, purpose, whatever, is in any sense at all related to conveying knowledge to anyone, uh, the viewers in particular, but to anyone at all. Because if they were actually interested in vetting these people, then it would be question A, speaker 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, however many people they have that got out of the clown car that night, uh, you will all answer the same question. The follow-ups uh, may be different, but everyone on every topic, that every question that is raised, should be uh, not only given the opportunity, but should be required to uh, make some kind of statement about what their position on it is, and a and a you know a brief moment to explain some generalities as to why they think that is the right position, so that the people who in this case will be the Democratic primary voters, uh, so that they can look through these candidates and they will actually have been told uh, on the same platform, with the same exposure, at the same time, what each person's position is. But the media doesn't do that because the media has absolutely no interest at all in having an informed electorate. It's infotainment. It's not meant to educate you. It's meant to be entertaining. That's why they, uh, this was brought up in the Repu by the Republicans, I think it was Ted Cruz, and it's like, you know, you media people, you, you moderators always do this. It's, uh, Donald Trump, uh, can you say something that insults Chris Christie? Chris Christie, can you say something bad about the wife of so-and-so? You know, yada, da, yada, da, yada, right on down the line. They want to entertain people with drama. They don't want you to know anything. But, uh, so that's a general complaint. But going on, uh, looking at the two nights of the debates, the first night I, I was thinking, I'm like, oh, you know, some people have learned something in the last couple of years. Donald Trump was not the focus of, that, of any candidate, uh, or, yeah, any candidate's uh, arguments. I think he was mentioned like three or four times, maybe five, something like that, mentioned very infrequently, and uh, they were actually, maybe they weren't giving great answers that were on the subject they were talking about, but at least they were talking in the direction of the question that, that uh, was proposed to them. And I thought that's that's good for them, that's smart for them. And then the second night came around and Donald Trump cropped up a lot more. And it seemed to me that, uh, well, okay, the, the people who don't have a great deal of name recognition uh, realize that they need to be here selling, you know, they're, they're not competing against Donald Trump. They're competing against the, their fellow Democrats on that stage. What the second group didn't realize is that they also are not competing against Donald Trump. They are competing against their Democrats on that stage and the one on the stage from the night before. But just like Hillary Clinton, they have anticipated that they have something that they've not yet earned and that they can bank that unearned thing and count on it. And I think I recall, I'm old enough to remember that that did not work out oh so well for uh, Hillary Clinton. But, you know, I, I, I've never accused uh, politicians of being the, the sharpest tools in the shed. So anyway... Um, you take people who you would think would have learned something, who got a, a raw deal last time, like Bernie Sanders, that he would be really interested in, in coming back with a much better packaged uh, argument uh, to avoid the problems and to make sure that the people know what it is that he's he, after, uh, that, that kind of thing, uh, and that he would not make such colossally stupid mistakes as he was in fact making. So one of the questions was, it was the flavor of, what is it about you, candidate whoever, that makes you the right person to uh, be president? What is it about you that makes you the right person to be the nominee? What is it that you bring that others don't? And uh, Bernie Sanders' response was, Donald Trump is a liar, 
I'm not quoting here. Donald Trump is a liar. Donald Trump is a sexist. Donald Trump is a misogynist. Donald Trump is a homophobe. Donald Trump is a xenophobe. You know, all the isms, phobes, ists, and you know, whatever else they can come up with uh, that you hear all the time being bandied about, you know, hither and tether, you are just you know, flying right out of his mouth, just tumbling right out of his mouth. And then he says that he's going to expose Donald Trump to the American people as when he means expo expose Donald Trump to the American people, what he means is he's going to say to the American people, here are some things about Donald Trump that, uh, that I think are true, uh, and you, you should also believe, and, and that should be like what I'm going to bring to the table. That's what you should really count on me to do. That's how I'm going to win. And they were that he's going to expose Trump as a liar, as a fraud, as a charlatan, as a big, bad, you know, evil man, a poopy head. And I'm like, I think I'm old enough to recall that, that, that I'm, it, it was in the distant past, and I'm getting up there in age, but I have dim memories from some years ago that a strategy not too dissimilar from this had been used in an election somewhere, and I don't think that it worked out well for the side that used it. But Bernie Sanders is clearly uh, signaling that he has no interest in actually being the nominee, and he has no interest in being president. He's just there to take up space uh, because he is incapable of, of learning. He's had a couple of years, a few years now to think it through and learned absolutely nothing. So that's Sanders' strategy. Now, um, some of the people who, sp who spoke uh, were so vacuous or, well, just so vacuous that I don't, I can't tell you their names. Uh, it was mentioned to me, I forgot them as soon as they started speaking, and I would kind of fast forward through some of them because I didn't think they'd have anything interesting to say, and they're going to be forgotten by tomorrow or the next week, whatever. They'll be gone soon, hopefully. But some of them, uh, the lesser well-known people, I've actually heard of. There was one woman on stage uh, whose existence I knew about, not because of anything that... Uh, I didn't know anything about what she did in the world or who she was, what she did for her profession, uh, whether she was alive or dead, but I knew the name. And the reason that I knew the name is because in my late teens and early 20s, uh, one of my hobbies was curating misattributed quotes, whether it be to ones that are completely fictitious uh, or ones that were just attributed to the wrong speaker. The, the trick there seems to be uh, find a quote that has it's uh, a twist on something. You know, it's got a you know okay, some thought went on. That's pretty clever, uh, but it wouldn't stand out unless you attach it to some really important figure's name. So some uh, you know figure from in antiquity who everyone's everyone has heard, but they don't really know what the person did or something like that, or some current uh, some modern political figure of great significance, and uh, and that will really uh, give it the juice that it needs to to make the rounds. And it works. It works by the way. So. Uh, I can't remember when it was, but it was an, uh, an Ellen DeGeneres comedy routine in the late 90s, I think. It was right after, she, it was not too long after she came out of the closet and her show was canceled, whatever year that was. And she was doing whatever uh, comedy things, you know, hi, I'm going to tell jokes. And one of them was about, you know that beautiful quote from Nelson Mandela, you know, uh, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate, our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Is our light not our darkness that most blah, blah, blah? And she actually said the blah, blah, blah in it. And uh, she was attributing it to Nelson Mandela, and it is attributed widely to Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, uh, it, that is not his quote. It was a quote of one of the Democratic candidates on the stage during the first night's debate, Marianne Williamson. She's the one who said it. Uh, I have learned since then she's an author and like a speaker. I don't know, whatever. <clears throat> so that's what I knew about her. Uh, I was like, okay, um, I, I've heard one quote from her. It was... A little poetic, so I'm going to hear her out. And what I learned from her about the things that make her different from everyone else on the stage is that I think she wants to be president to uh, add some some new names to her celebrity Rolodex because she wants to call a whole bunch of people around the world, like you, you know, call up the prime minister of New Zealand and tell her, "Hey, girlfriend," you know, something like that. And she wants to call people in Europe and say, "I'm back" or "We're back" or whatever it is. So I guess she's going to, if we need like a hostess in chief. I guess she could get the job. Maybe maybe they should hire her full-time to do that because it seems to be her thing. So gossiping, being a chatty Cathy on the phone, uh, that's, that's what she's got going for. And uh, bizarrely enough, um, I don't want to get inside the head of other people too much, but this was just a little bit uh, creepy to me when she said it. And I, think, I was like, is she trying to have you know go on a date with the president or maybe get hate-fucked by him? Because, you know, she's like, you bring your fear, you bring your hatred, whatever it was, and I'll bring my love, and we'll meet, and we'll fight it out. And I'm like, well, okay. So uh, she's going to be gone soon, thankfully. So there's that. 
there was one guy, uh, Andrew Yang or something like that, who was asked about this plan of giving every American uh, adult a thousand dollars per month, and uh, the moderator says uh, that's going to be you know about three point two trillion dollars per year. Uh, per year, how are you going to pay for it? And the guy's like, I'm, I'm sorry, huh? <laughs> what? Yeah. The funny thing about that is the guy's a lawyer. He runs a business that, that teaches entrepreneurs how to be better entrepreneurs, how to secure funding, how to do presentations. And I'm, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that the, the, the little, uh, I don't know, the course on presentations doesn't start out with, make sure you don't know your figures. Don't, don't worry about how much it's going to cost to do the thing you're asking for investment to do. Just, you know, wing it. Investors love it. So he's going to be gone soon. And uh, it's like, okay, I, I don't know. Maybe he didn't hear the question, but it is not the, the best start for you know, selling yourself to the American people for, for when you're told how much this program you want to do is going to cost. And you go, I'm sorry, huh? <laughs> Say what? <laughs> and then it was just a, a, a gibberish kind of response anyway once he got into it, even assuming that the reason he said, I'm sorry, huh, was because he didn't hear the question. The actual explanation was, was uh, a bit peculiar. But anyway, moving on. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, she didn't say any. she didn't like uh, blow me away with anything particularly stupid. She was just being Elizabeth Warren. But there's nothing really memorable, memorable about Elizabeth Warren other than, you know, just normal Elizabeth Warren. I don't remember anything that she said. It was just so, you know, unimportant. Then there was uh, this, this congresswoman named Gabbard. Yeah, Gabbard. And uh, she said, she says, uh, that she joined the military after 9-11. And uh, she wanted to take the fight to the people who had done the bad things to us on 9-11. And I thought... Okay, and then she goes, and I, uh, I served for 16 years, so I'm thinking, I'm, you know, adding things up in my head as she's talking, just because I do that, kind of, do that kind of stuff, and then she says, and I currently serve as a major in the National Guard, and I thought, you know, 2001 plus 16 is not 2019, there seems to be a bit of a gap in there somewhere, uh, the gap originally I thought, well, maybe she served 16 years and then left, but no, it's just she's trying to to pretend that she did something that did not, that she didn't, in fact, not to do, it would be just as honest for me to say that I joined the military after Pearl Harbor. It's literally true. Uh, Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor happened in the 40s. <laughs> I did not join until the 90s. So I, I joined after Pearl Harbor. It was outrageous what happened at Pearl Harbor, and I joined after that. Now there were actually Americans who joined after 9-11 in the sense that anybody's going to understand the phrase. I did this after 9-11 to mean that, uh, you know, in the vicinity of 9-11 as a direct response to what happened uh, on 9-11. Um, and they actually deserve that kind of credit for what she's trying to claim credit for. There were some people who didn't join right after 9-11 because they couldn't join because they weren't old enough. But as soon as they were old enough, they went straight into the service to, you know, bring, it, bring the fight to the big baddies who, you know, knock down the towers. Gabbard's not one of those. She was of age. She was a, a political assistant or aide or something like that, and she did that for a couple of years. And then, uh, and then she decided to join um, for the Iraq bit. They, that's where she was going. So I'm like, uh, Iraq actually had nothing to do with 9-11, but I realized at the time a lot of people were saying that it did, but whatever. So I, I thought, well, I don't particularly like it when people try to gussy up the reasons that they've done. It should be, it should be fully sufficient to say, uh, I have served in the military for 16 years. I currently hold the rank of major without trying to pretend that, like that you were so outraged by something that happened years before that finally you couldn't take it anymore and you had to get into the fight. If you were really that outraged, you would have joined September 12th, September 13th, September 14th. You would have joined right after, you know, after September 11th in the way most, most people are going to say, most people are going to hear when someone says, X event happened and then I did this. It, it, uh, it, people aren't going to take that to mean there's been you know years that have gone by, but that's uh, that's the the fabrication that she wants uh, to put out there. So good luck with that. I don't think she's going to have much staying power. Um, there were a couple people who I thought did well, and would, they're saying things that if you were a Democrat you would like. Uh, Pete uh, Buttigieg 
did I think he did reasonably well. He had some good um, commentary. He had some stupid commentary, but I'm, I'm talking here about if I were a Democrat, he had some good things to say. He's got all the you know the the normal uh, platitudes about oh racial injustice this and you know we need bias training for the cops. Even the by the way also that we need to we need to think about science. So to the extent that social science is actually science. One thing is exceedingly obvious on the standards of social science is that bias training doesn't work. And in fact, it very often produces the precise opposite outcome because as it turns out, people who aren't uh, racists don't like to be called racists. It angers them. Uh, people who aren't misogynists or sexists don't like to be told that they are when they're not. It tends to upset them. So you, you, you get worse outcomes than if you say nothing at all. Uh, and this is one of the reasons uh, that this is so, uh, that it doesn't work, is because the thing that determine, that they use to help determine when you need to have this kind of training is a bullshit tool. It is not, it, it, even the, uh, the people who invented it from Harvard, the people who came up with this instrument, have acknowledged uh, that it doesn't do what uh, it's supposed to do. It can't, even in principle. It has no way to distinguish between, for example, novelty and racism. It has, uh, anyway, it, uh, it fails the test-retest metrics that you want. If, if a person takes a test, um, like a blood test, and it says, you do the first blood test and it says, I don't know, you have AIDS, and then you go back uh, and you sample the same blood, and then the same on the same machine it says, you don't have AIDS, and then you do it again and it says, you do have AIDS, and then you don't have AIDS. That There's no, there's no there there. It's just, your, your instrument is screwed. It doesn't work. Throw it away. Uh, get a new instrument. Get a better instrument. When the work's cleaned out, whatever it is, it, uh, it, it, in principle, it can't tell you anything useful. It's just, uh, you know, you flip a coin. Yep, you're HIV positive. Yep, you have cancer. Yep, you're pregnant. Whatever it is that you would do just as well. Actually, you would do better. <laughs> you would do just as well, I'll say, to do it that way. Because the instrument you've selected it has no predictive utility at all. Because in principle, it can't do what it is supposed to do. These, these un so-called unconscious bias, which by which they mean subconscious. I don't have any unconscious bias. Uh, when I'm unconscious, there's not a lot of bias going on. Anyway. So there's, uh, there's, there's that. But he, he wants to shove that down the throats of his department. And it's interesting that since he became mayor, uh, they have been losing uh, minority officers. They've been, they've been leaving. So I don't know what that's all about, but whatever. So he's got all the, he's got all the right Democrat platitudes, the feminist talking points. They're complete nonsense, but he, he says them, and he's eloquent, so there's that. He also made a good point that anybody who's going to say that uh, you're, you're for Medicare for all, uh, you have an obligation to, when those words roll off your tongue, to explain how you get from what we have now to what it is that uh, you, you claim you, uh, you want to take us to, how you're going to get there. And I think that's true not just of Medicare for all. I think every politician is saying the state of the world, A, is what we have now. I want to bring about state of the world, B, uh, and here is how the transition is going to happen. Um, and you should really think about these things before you get on the debate stage that, that uh, cramped. It's no argument, by the way, to say, oh, well, there are a lot of people on stage. Yes, and you knew that going in. You're supposed to tailor what it is you have to say, not the content of it, but you know, some long forms you can talk more, short form questions you talk less. You have to you know, figure out what the time scale is going to be and then craft your answers to fit within that while giving a person you know, an adequate amount of information or it, I won't say an adequate amount of information, but as much information as you can get in there without a whole bunch of detours and things of that nature. There didn't seem to be any thought given to that by, by anyone. Uh, you know, like, look, look uh, the clown car is very, very large. Most of you are going to get more than a few seconds to talk, a couple minutes over the hour or whatever it is. So you, you really need to think about your positions and come up with uh, not the 30-second sound bite, not some pat response, but, you know, some some number of talking points that are followed up by why the talking point. And you need to figure out what your, your speaking time is going to be and then, you know, figure out what not to include and what to include. So there's that. Hopefully as time goes on, they'll get more opportunities to speak longer and everyone will get the same question, which would be useful. So there's that. And there are just a, a lot of people who, you know, there's a former governor of Colorado, like Hickenlooper, whatever his name is. He's like, I'm a scientist. I'm like, yeah, okay, you're a scientist, great. You know, I'm a scientist. We did this in Colorado, and here's Colorado's diversity. I'm like, I seem to recall that there was not too long ago that Colorado was the only state in the Union at the time that amended its constitution to discriminate against gays. I don't think uh, 
Colorado is quite the diverse place that you want to pretend that it is, but okay. So, you know, good, good luck to you, sir. Many happy returns. He's going to be gone soon. Um, so I, I have no idea who the frontrunners are going to be. I mean, obviously Biden is going to be there, and he didn't really take a great deal of damage. He, I mean, he did take some, but when you, you know, you're Joe Biden, you can afford to take a little bit before it really starts to hurt you because you're so you know, such a large figure in comparison to the others. Uh, Kamala Harris is... I don't know why people get really engaged by her. She is just... If she were an actress, she would be one of those ones whose face can't move because of all the Botox. She'd be, like, completely plastic. You know, um, you, you, you don't know what's real on her. Like, she'd have the nails out to there and the, the eye, eyelashes out to here and the plumped-up lips and the, the fake thing you stick her there to make your lips look bigger and the nose would be done and would be pinched so it's nice and cute and, you know, the, they'd have that, like, that lizard look like, oh, my God, my skin's been pulled so back. My vagina's actually right here. It's between my boobs. Uh, that is, that's my... Like, I translate that, map that onto a politician, and that is Kamala Harris to me. Um, but some people seem to like her. And she was talking about Joe Biden's busing issue and how uh, Joe Biden had gotten his way, that the little black girl in California, who was Kamala Harris in the story, played by, uh, who knows, uh, would not have been able to go to the schools because the buses are how she got there. Yeah, that, and Joe Biden's position was that busing should be decided by local governments uh, in relation to their own local needs. It should not be a federal thing where it says everyone and everywhere has to do this because reasons. And uh, as it turns out, uh, it, Joe Biden's position would not have stopped her. Uh, there was no problem there at all because the busing si si uh, uh, situation was resolved where she grew up by the local government, just like Joe Biden thought it should be done. Apparently that was back when Joe Biden knew what federalism was, which I'm not so sure he knows anymore. So anyway, the there's that, and then of course you have uh, you know the media, the moderators, doing their own part. The because not everyone at, is going to be asked the same question because they will they will whine and complain that because of the time constraints, they act like you know someone walked up to them and put a gun to their head and said, you must overcrowd the stage and you must only do this for an hour. You may not go more than an hour or more than 90 minutes. You came up with this. It was your idea. It's like in the Senate or the, the House when there are hearings. The senator or the Congress creature who's asking questions will complain about, oh, I only have five minutes. You guys are the ones who impose the five-minute rule on yourselves. If it's inconvenient, give yourselves 10 minutes. Uh, you know, Or make a rule that your time only runs when you speak, not when the person is answering the question. So if they want to talk for a little bit, of t a little while, they can't run down the clock on you. But you guys are the ones who chose the clock. You chose the size of the field. It is absolutely not a valid complaint that because oh, well, the time's short. You know, we've got so many people up here. What can we do? So we have to, we have to, I guess, just only let certain people whom we, incidentally, who turn out to be the people whom we favor, uh, we can only let certain people talk. You know, for a long time. So we have to pick and choose. No, you don't. You, you can, you, you could do it a different way. You choose not to do it a dif uh, different way because, as I mentioned at the beginning, you have absolutely no interest, whatever, in educating people. You have an interest only in shoving your narrative down their throat, and you put the thinnest patina of, of, of something that will serve as a defense against claims that, you know, you aren't, you're not trying, you're, you're not against claims that say you aren't trying to inform the American public. Look how many people we had. They engage in all these tactics to make sure that when the decision to of when to move on, the decision when not to let a follow-up, the decision when to switch the question, can be shifted to not, this is my preference and I want to, uh, I want to give you the good question and I want to like take the legs out from this person I don't like. They want to blame the rules. When you make the rules and you choose the size of the field that have you for the time, uh, the rules are not a valid excuse for you. You you have decided that, uh, and then you, you game it for your own tactical advantage, which is exactly what they're going to do. I would have thought that uh, with the declining ratings and uh, left-wing media outlets over the last couple of years that they would learn. Uh, you know, apparently the layoffs aren't teaching them anything, the decline in readership, the less money they're getting from ad revenue because they're not as popular and so they can't, they can't work out the same uh, contracts as they used to work out, and therefore they have to lay off more people. You, know, you would think that, that this cycle 
would be obvious to them, but it, it is not. Uh, so all of that is to say that I think the only people who actually learned anything from watching the last uh, presidential election and what's been happening with the media were on the stage on the first day, um, but those aren't going to be the people with whom we're going to be contending and watching contend with each other uh, going forward. I think uh, virtually all of them are going to be eliminated pretty quickly. Possibly Elizabeth Warren will stick around. I don't know. Uh, it could go either way. I just don't think that she has the staying power, though. Although if she does get kicked out, I guess she could say that it's because she got kicked out for her Indian heritage. Who knows? Anyway, so that, that's my first take on it. It it was a complete... Well, it was soporific. I mean, if you have sleeping problems, turn that on and watch it. You will be out like a light. So that's all I have to say about uh, the Democratic primary so far. We will see what happens uh, during the next round of debates. Have a good night.